Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyidina rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima alamtana wa zidna min fadlika ilman wa ta'lima innaka ala kulli shay'in qadir wa ba'd. Alhamdulillahi wa shukru lillah. This is lesson 57. And last week we introduced the subject of maghazi or the expeditions and battles of both the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he participated in directly as well as the saraya or the expeditions done by his companions. So we looked at Maghazi as a subgenre within the seerah and we looked at its history, its early development and its significance for understanding the seerah because when you get to the Medinan period of the Sirah, you see very clearly that straight away you're learning about the Ghazawat, the Battle of Badr, the Saraya before Badr, and those after. And so that forms a significant portion of the details we learn about in the Medinan period of the Sirah. And as I said last week, it is very important that we lay down foundations that serve as keys for understanding the seerah. This is, this tends to be the way I do things. I sometimes drag certain topics out longer than they may be dragged out in other classes, but I hope to address principles and foundations and go into details in the beginning that become reference points for understanding things that occur later on, right? So the more you understand the foundations and the principles, the easier it is to understand the things that develop later on in the seerah. So last week, as we talked about Maghazi as this subgenre in the seerah, I was going into a little bit of a reflection slash rant towards the end. And I wanted to pick back up on that before we go into the actual historical details in the end of this first year of the Hijrah. And one of the things we've touched on time and time again is how modern human beings are so disconnected from nature, the natural world, that they don't fully grasp the significance of certain references in the Quran to signs in nature. A good example that applies to us especially is how disconnected we are from the moon. You hear the poetry, the qasaid, Tala al Badru alayna. You hear the hadith of Jabir, radiallahu anhu, where he describes the Prophet as being more beautiful than the moon. And he doesn't use just the word moon, Laylatul Badr, right? We just hear full moon on a dark night. And you drive out and you see a full moon on a dark night, but it's not the full thing because you have all of the, the, the light pollution in the city. Uh, or you live in a very overcast part of the U.S. So, and because we're not paying attention to the phases of the moon, we're, not, we're dealing with, uh, uh, with light pollution, we're not fully grasping the meaning and significance of those descriptors when they say, Tala al Badru alayna. And you got to put yourself in the mind and the mentality and experience of the people who said these things. And, you know, for me, personally speaking, that only happened uh, once in my life when I was in Mauritania in West Africa in the middle of the Sahara. And I just happened to wake up one day at 3 a.m. Something had awoken me. And I went outside and I brought my flashlight, but it just so happened it was a full moon. As soon as I get outside, I turn the flashlight off because I didn't need it. The moon was so, as a full moon on a dark night, it was so powerful as it is lighting up the sands that the sands of the Sahara felt like a moonscape itself. And you could see as far as the eye could see, just from the light of the moon. And it was so large and so beautiful. And it was then I realized what the Sahaba may have been getting at when they said, Tala al Badru alayna. It's not just this bright thing in the sky, 
that looks really bright and luminous is also illuminating and bringing clarity to things on the ground. So there's this disconnection we have in nature. We don't understand the significance of some of these references in the Quran either because we're disconnected. And just as that disconnection exists between us and nature and the signs of nature, there's also disconnection between us and understanding and appreciating uh, human norms in society, human interactions as they have been observed for thousands of years because we live in a very curated, sanitized experience, we often think that this is normal and that everything in the past was just brutish, barbarian behavior. And sure, that existed back then, but that exists today as well. But it's so sanitized from our daily experience, we theorize about those things. They're just ideas out there. We're not living them. So a part of understanding the seerah and appreciating the lessons is understanding human interaction, right? And that's why in the very beginning of the seerah, when we talked about the nature of Arabian society, I had you all do that mental exercise of thinking what it would take for you to live and survive in a post-apocalyptic environment where it's you and your small team in the wilderness trying to survive. What would you need to do to survive and thrive and grow? What kind of alliances would you have to make? How would you set about your perimeter? How would you secure resources? Taking you to that as an exercise would help you understand the tribal mentality, where there's no police, there's no military, and it's really you against the other tribe. And you either create alliances or you're fighting them, but the presumption is that they're after your resources and you're after theirs and whoever gets it, gets it. And it could be a battle ensuing. So to get into that mentality helps you understand why the Sahaba and why the Quraysh and why all of the players in this story behaved the way they did and reacted the way they did in various ways. So just as we had that exercise to understand the jahili or tribal mentality, we also have to look at the norms of human interaction across thousands of years to understand the ghazawat, to understand the nature of war, of battles, expeditions, human conflict, because it's only through understanding it through the proper uh, prism or the proper lens that you understand the seerah uh, as it is supposed to be understood and not through the lenses of someone in 2022 who lives in some ivory tower in a sanitized environment as if they're looking down on humanity, judging them based on a standard that is really an anomaly in human history. So let's address a little bit about that. Many people today in the modern world like to think that they are nonviolent. They pride themselves on being nonviolent they claim to abhor violence, and some people believe, uh, out of their confusion, that if only we had enough technology, if only we had enough enlightened uh, thinking, we would be able to create a utopia in this world where there's no human conflict. And as Muslims, we are very well aware of the Qur'an's description of the dunya, the lower world, we know the nature of the dunya, and from that description, we understand that the dunya is in no way going to be a utopia. It's not. The dunya is not a utopia. So this means that as Muslims, we have guidance from the Quran about the nature of the dunya, and we have guidance from the Quran in the sunnah in terms of sharia for how we govern ourselves in this less than perfect world. The sharia, the body of law that governs what we say and do and how we transact with people is meant for smoothing out these contours of human conflict, is meant for minimizing conflict and reducing conflict, but it's not revealed for people uh, who live in a utopia where there is no conflict. The great majority of the body of Sharia law pertains to interactions with people right? Trade, 
marriage, divorce, inheritance, criminal law, and so on. And these are all there to minimize conflict or to address conflicts that have already arisen. So our Sharia has been given to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and clarified by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, given to us as imperfect human beings living, living in an imperfect world known as dunya. Sharia is not sent for angels who don't commit sins and who do not have conflicts. So as Muslims, we recognize this reality. There is a very well-known uh, conservative thinker from the 50s. He was very popular on TV. His name was William F. Buckley, uh, a great thinker. And he has this phrase he coined many, many years ago. And he says, do not immunitize the eschaton. <laughs> Do not immunitize the eschaton. And you're hearing this and you're wondering, what in the world does that mean? Uh, well, what does imminent mean? Well, imminent means the here and the now. What is the eschaton? Well, the eschaton can refer to the signs of the day of judgment, but it also refers to the afterlife. So what he is saying when he says do not immunitize the eschaton is that do not think that you are going to come up with a system whereby you can create paradise on earth. Think about human history and think about all of the times where we had massive human carnage and bloodshed. Oftentimes, those events were from people who thought they could create a paradise on earth. They thought they could, if they just managed human beings better, if they just used uh, modern scientific thinking apply to humans, they could create a utopia on earth. And instead of getting utopia, they got death, destruction, mayhem, and all sorts of evil things. So we recognize that dunya is dunya and jannah is jannah, and there's no utopia on earth. We see that in the Medina period of the seerah. If there's any utopia, the closest thing to utopia in the world, where would it be and when? It would be in Medina in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. That is the peak of human development, and that is the peak of human history. Right? Really, after that, everything is downwards. Right? But even in that society, ruled by the greatest human being and the greatest of Allah's creation, وسلم, there were still problems. There were still conflicts. There were still people who dealt with bad habits of jahiliyyah. There were hypocrites, there were plots, there were uh, people not always getting along because it is a human society. Despite the fact that if there's anything like a utopia, that would be the closest thing to it because what makes it a utopia in this case is not everything being perfect in terms of daily uh, interactions with people, it's the fact that it is the the place of hijrah for Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, where you have companionship with him. All right. So we know the nature of the world and how it's not a utopia. So because of that, it should come as no surprise to us that Allah Taala has revealed verses, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has detailed rulings for how we live in this non-utopia called dunya, and therefore we should not be surprised that there are laws revealed concerning and governing. Jihad, which is martial jihad, fighting, struggling in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we should not be dishonest and act as if the word jihad refers just to struggle. Oh, I struggle to manage my temper when I don't have enough coffee in the morning. That is my jihad. Or my jihad is uh, not having road rage when I'm in, in a rush to get to work, or my jihad is changing my baby's diaper, that is my jihad. That is taking the word jihad from a linguistic sense and applying it to daily life as if that's the sharia meaning. That's a struggle for sure, but that's not what the word jihad means as a haqiqa shar'iya, as a legal term. We defined that last week and we looked at the stages in which it was revealed. We don't shy away from that. There are people who think that they are more enlightened than everyone else in ancient history. They think that in ancient history it was all barbarism and darkness. 
And many people fail to distinguish between just and unjust violence. But there are people who think that they've risen above violence and above the nasty and violent culture of their ancestors. But we say to them that they are wrong. Not only are they wrong, but they are delusional because even in today's time, in the quote unquote modern world, they, like everyone else, relies on implicit threats of violence every single day. I want you to understand this. This is a kind of a mindset shift. Everyone in the modern world relies on implicit threats of violence every single day. Every single government in the world today are by their nature coercive. They have to be coercive because order in these societies demands the ability to stop people from doing certain things. Because ultimately, any, any threat that's not backed implicitly with the threat of violence is just a suggestion. What if the person doesn't want to accept the suggestion? Are you going to say, oh, well, we're just, we'll just think you're not a nice person? And they say, okay, so what? I'll just take what you have. So every society has behind the scenes that implicit threat of violence that keeps people from doing certain things. Some people are self-directed to not do wrong things, but others are not. And the only thing that stops them is that implicit threat or that explicit threat that if they do that, someone's going to step in and stop them. Allah affirms this in the Quran, right? We read last week, right? وَلَوْلَا دَفْعُ اللَّهِ Right? Had Allah not repelled one group of people by another, then things would have been corrupted. So that's the reality of this world. Every law, every tax code is actually, it demands this escalating progression of penalties that in the end must result in the, the seizure of that person's property or their imprisonment. And if they don't want to give up their property or, go in, or become imprisoned, what happens? People come and take them in. And how do they get them in? Implicit threats of force. So even in this society, everything is governed by that implicit threat of force to uh, ensure that certain people don't act out and do different things. So you can make moral arguments and appeals to reason and emotion, and people are moved by these things. And they, people who have morals won't do the wrong thing. But what about the person who says no? What if you appeal to someone's reason and their morals and use emotional arguments to not do the wrong thing and take someone else's rights, but after all of that they say, no thank you. What's the next step? Are you just going to say, well, you're not a nice person and we're not going to share with you. We're, we we're going to think you're not a nice person. They could say, I don't care. Right? So unless there is in a society that implicit threat that someone will be stopped, what's to stop them from going further and taking people's things and harming them? And that is in the modern world. So in a pacifist society, because right, people think they're pacifists and they're beyond all of this, America, North America, the West, the world, every, there is no pacifist society anywhere. Because in a truly pacifist society, if someone decides to go against the law and the social code, they're just going to say, what are you going to do about it? And people will just use emotional appeals that they're free to ignore, right? So no society does that. Every society has rules and order. So the modern world relies not necessarily on direct threats of violence from citizens, but the citizens in Western society rely on proxy violence done on their behalf. What are the police for? The police are there as the, pro this is the proxy violence of the citizen. They're not the ones doing it, the police are. So that's something that is a, a, a constant in human history. So the police do it, the military does it, but in a society where there's no police and no military, who's going to do that? That's the people themselves who organize in these bands of soldiers and fighters and that's why when we talk about the ghazawat we want to understand human nature and how humans resolve conflict so 
the modern world is actually a human anomaly compared to the history of humanity. We've seen time and time again how we have to understand these human norms and these anomalies to really appreciate the seerah and understand it through the framework of the norms of most of human history and not just through the myopic lenses of really post, post-modernity or post-World War II, you could say, uh, globalist liberal world order, right? So having said all of that and having given all of these disclaimers and explanation from last week, we've now looked at the Ghazawat, their basis, their importance, their significance, and now we can look at the first of these. So we're still in the first year, and we're, we're in the lead up to the biggest and the most major of these early battles, which is the Battle of Badr. Before the Battle of Badr, there are certain expeditions and a couple of small, small skirmishes we'll talk about. But before we get to that, let's, let's look at what's going on in the society in terms of legislation. And let's look very briefly at something of the family life of the Prophet Because for the past couple of weeks, we've been looking at Ghazawat and the things leading up to conflict after the covenant and the plots and trickery done by some of the communities. So let's look at Tashriya. Where are we in the Sira? We're in the first year after the Hijrah. We're almost at the end of that first year. And in that first year, there was no Ramadan. Ramadan as a month of fasting has not been legislated yet. But people were fasting one day of the year, and that was the 10th of Muharram. That became legislated for the Muslims. And it's as if it was legislated as one day, as a way of preparing Muslims for fasting for an entire month. Also, in this first year, the Muslims who migrated from Mecca to Medina and the, and the Ansar, they're used to praying all of their prayers as two rak'ahs. But now in this first year, those two rak'ah prayers are changed up. And Fajr remains as two, but now you have Dhuhr as four, Asr as four, Maghrib as three, and Isha as four. So now the Salat, its number of rak'at are changing in this first year. And also in this first year, the details of Tahara, of purification, of Janaba, of Ghusl, all of these things are revealed in this first year. So the Sharia is starting, the details of the laws are being fleshed out very early on. Uh, not everything. Hajj will be legislated much later, but soon we have Zakat in the second year. And before that, you have Zakat al Fitr being an obligation first before Zakat. So just like the fasting of Muharram, you have the preparation for fasting Ramadan. You have Zakat al Fitr followed by Zakat. So these things are being fleshed out in this first year. In terms of family matters, when the Masjid of the Prophet ﷺ was nearing the end of its construction, the Prophet ﷺ instructed that two small dwellings be built and attached to the eastern wall of the Masjid. So the construction is almost complete and he instructed them to add these two buildings attached to the eastern wall. One was to be the a house slash apartment, the dwelling for his wife Sauda bin Zam'a and the other for his soon to be wife Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha. We haven't really spoken a lot about the family life of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam but at this stage the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was ready to move them into these two homes that have been constructed next to the masjid. So near the completion of these two homes, the Prophet ﷺ tells Zayd ibn Haritha to bring Sauda to Medina. And so he brings Sauda to Medina and she settles in this house. Who is Sauda? Sauda bin Zam'a radiallahu anha, she was married to the Prophet ﷺ about one year after the passing of his beloved Sayyida Khadija radiallahu anha. 
And if you go back further in the seerah, we actually mentioned her, not her story, but she was in a list of those Muslims who migrated to Habasha. So she migrated to Habasha early on, and she went back from Habasha back to Mecca when her husband, Sakran bin Amr, had died. So it wasn't too long after that that uh, the Prophet وسلم, had married Aisha, the actual Aqad, and she was betrothed. So by the first year of the Hijrah, the Prophet وسلم, has these two houses built, and he has Zayd uh, escort Sauda to come to Medina. And soon the family of Abu Bakr will arrive as well, uh, with his sister Qurayba staying behind in, in Mecca to, get, to look after their father. So the family units are starting to come together now in this first year, which tells you that there was some preparation being made for their arrival so that when they arrive, they have a house, they have some place to settle into, and they wouldn't just be staying as a guest with someone. So by the end of this first year, of the Hijrah, the Prophet وسلم, also instructs his first cousin Zainab bint Jahsh to get married to Zayd ibn al Haritha. And this marriage took place in, in this first year of the Hijrah. So Zayd, who had fetched Sauda, is now married to Zainab bint Jahsh. Radiallahu anha. And there's a story about this that's going to come out later on in the Seerah. We're not going to talk about it now. We're just looking at the family structure. But we do know that because uh, she is uh, Qurayshi and Zayd ibn Haritha is not. He's Kindi. So she was initially opposed to the idea of getting married to Zayd ibn Haritha. But when she spoke with the Prophet wasallam, she took his advice and got married to Zayd. We do know that a few years later they get divorced and that later on, we know something we'll talk about later, inshallah. I'll leave it ambiguous for now. But the families are coming together slowly. Not long after this in the first year, Abu Bakr finally gets the family all together. His daughter, Asma bint Abi Bakr, remember her? She was the one who got knocked down and smacked when she was at the house and her father and the Prophet ﷺ had made the hijrah. Well, by now, Asma is back. She's in Medina now, and she gets married. Who does she get married to? Anyone know the name? Gets married to Zubair. And then Abu Bakr's sister, we said, Qurayba remains in Mecca to care for the father, Abu Quhafa. Abu Quhafa is blind, so there's no one to look after him. She stays behind to take care of him. She is a believer. Abu Quhafa, her father, is not. Yet. He will be but not yet, that would take some time. So this is the family situation in brief. The families are all coming together now. The masjid is built and the permission is given by Allah Ta'ala to fight those who have fought you and expelled you from your homes. And this is where we get to the part of the seerah where we look at the ghazawat and saraya, the expeditions and the battles. So during this first year, as the Muslims were settling in Medina, understand that the Quraysh didn't stop their business. Why would they? Allah Ta'ala refers to this business in the Quran when he recounts the blessings. He mentions among those blessings, Rihlat al-Shita'i wa Saif, the journeys they would take by winter and by summer. What are these referring to? These are referring to the trade caravans that will go north, and they would go south. They would go north to Sham, the Byzantine area where they would trade their wares and also purchase wares and bring them back. And they would journey south to the Yemen to do the exact same thing. So you had here two civilizations. To the north you had the Byzantines, the Rum, and to the south you had the, the uh, Habasha, you had the, imp the Aksum Empire that was ruling substantial parts of Yemen at the time. Now, those trade caravans remained open. They were still going because that's their main economic activity besides entertaining the pilgrims. So they weren't going to stop that. That was very important to them. So they're still plying these routes. And they were unharmed in this initial period of the first year. 
when they were going up and coming back to Mecca from Sham. But when Allah Ta'ala gave the Ithin, the divine permission to fight, the Prophet Sallallahu acted on this divine permission and he began to send out troops to engage in reconnaissance and scouting. They would engage in scouting operations to look to see where the caravans were moving, what routes, and if possible to intercept them and take those things which were it was a part of the economic uh, retaliation and fighting that was permitted. So what's going on in the background here? How do we piece this all together? You have to understand that Quraysh were not these uh, passive, uh, peaceful, non-aggressive people who just let the Muslims go to Medina and live happily ever after. We mentioned a couple of weeks ago how they're obviously aware that all of these people have left. They've left their homes and they've left their property, which they've uh, confiscated. They're aware of the Muslim presence in Medina and that the Prophet wasallam has this covenant with the various tribes. What do they do? We know from the seerah that they begin sending letters to some of the munafiqun, some of these people who are still mushrikun among the Arab tribes, encouraging them to revolt to rebel, to somehow, if possible, overthrow the Prophet ﷺ, so that would not be, so he would not be a threat. And giving them this support meant that conflict was absolutely in inevitable. Because of this, the Muslims needed to show Quraysh that though they are a new community that have migrated, they did not leave Mecca because they're cowards. They left Mecca because that was the permission of God Almighty and the command to set up a place of safety, a place of security where Islam is the governing way of life. So they needed to show Quraysh that though they've migrated, they're not cowards and that they will fight and they will retake what has been taken from them. And the way to do that is to target these trade routes because Quraysh would be weakened financially if these caravans are raided and that would limit their financial ability to wage war and continue plotting against the Muslims. So you have to think about it from that perspective. Their economy depended largely on these trade caravans, the Ruhlat al-Shita'i wa saif in the winter and the summer, as well as receiving the pilgrims. So to get, if you look at this map, it's a very inaccurate map, but we have the picture on the WhatsApp group, the actual um, proper drawing. You see the trade routes, here's Mecca uh, over here. They have to go north to get to the Byzantine areas, which means that they're coming very close to Medina and the Muslims can easily intercept them if they know where they're going and what route they're taking. So a lot of the early Ghazawat and Saraya centered on the Muslims going out to collect intelligence, to scout and reconnoiter areas to find where the caravans were heading, or acting on intelligence that they received, hoping to meet those caravans while they're on the route to then uh, seize the goods, to basically take that and bring it back to Medina. This would weaken them financially. Now, obviously based on the geography, if you look at the trade routes, Mecca is far south to Medina. You have the Rihla going north and you have the Rihla going south. Which one do you think is going to be the easiest one to intercept? Obviously the north ones because that's going towards the direction of Medina. However, we're going to see in the seerah how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would uh, try to take Quraysh by surprise by also doing the same for the journey south where they wouldn't have expected them to come. So a lot of the early Ghazawat are targeting them in the north. So this brings us to the actual Saraya and Ghazawat. In the books of Sirah, if you go to the shorter books that are really summaries of the Sirah story, it'll tell you a little bit about some of the skirmishes that led up to Badr. They'll tell you about uh, Badr al-Ula, the smaller Badr that led to the bigger one. But they don't often tell you about the individual saraya and what took place. But we want to look at, look at them briefly because they all set the stage 
for Badr itself. It's, a, it's this escalation that's happening slowly that ultimately leads to Badr, the, the battle of Badr that we'll cover. So what is considered the first expedition in the history of Islam? The first expedition is the expedition of Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And this expedition was to the seashore. Uh, the first battle, if you call it a battle or a ghazwa, was that of Hamza radiallahu anhu, where he received from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the liwa. You're going to hear this a lot in the seerah. What is the li- li- liwa? It is the battle standard because the norms for battle in human history involved uh, knowing very clearly the sides involved. Your side would have a liwa, a rallying banner for the troops. And the, the liwa was the battle standard designed to be carried in battle. And the person given the, the liwa is held in a position of authority and respect. And it was a great honor to carry the, the battle flag. And that's, that's, that's been a norm for most nations and most peoples through human history. The idea of carrying the battle flag or the idea of fighting to get the battle flag off the ground, to hoist it up, to r- rouse the troops and build the morale in the heat of battle. All of those motifs come from ancient history. So Hamza radiallahu anhu received this liwa and this expedition was in the month of Ramadan. So it was actually seven months after the hijrah. He and some troops went out to intercept a caravan from Sham. Who happened to be in this caravan? None other than Abu Jahl. But it was him along with 300 other men. So it could have been a fight, but we learned that it was a stalemate and a battle didn't happen. And the reason why is because there was a party in the caravan who was seen as a neutral party who was not in conflict with the Muslims and that neutral party basically talked with both sides and it became a stalemate Abu Jahl agreed to go back to Mecca and the Muslims agreed and it didn't escalate so he went back to Mecca and the Muslims went back to Medina no blood was shed whatsoever but it did kind of sound the alarm bells for the, for the mushrikun. Because think about this. This is the first time in all of these years that here are a bunch of Muslims who set out some 60 or 70 people to 300, but they're strapped, they're armed, and they're ready to fight. So now Abu Jahl returns to Mecca, and he's quite alarmed. And he goes to the elders of Quraysh, and tells them you have to be very, very careful now moving northward because you're going in these areas, there's a chance you may be intercepted by the followers of Muhammad So that kind of set off the alarm bells for them. The second Ghazwa, so by the way, looking at this chart at number one, this Ris Valley, which is further north, that's where it took place. The second one took place uh, in the month of Shawwal, so you're right after Ramadan, they continue. And this was the Ghazwa, or the expedition of Ubaida ibn al-Harith to a place called Radigh. Radigh, as you see, it's kind of in between here. There's a valley, and then there's a, a, an area, an encampment, a town. And this took place in the month of Shawwal. The Prophet sallallahu sent Ubaida with 60 to 80 riders, uh, and they were all from the, muh- the Muhajirun. That's interesting, you see, in these pattern, in this, the early Ghazawat, is that all the ones who are being sent out by the Prophet them were from the Muhajirun, right? It will be later that you get the Ansar, but in the, in the beginning, no Ansari is going out with this group. So 60 to 80 riders, riders from the Muhajirun, and they went out to a place called Radigh, which is 10 miles from Juhfa, so you can see the, <laughs> the scale doesn't work for the map. It's a crude drawing, but it was 10 miles from Juhfa. And they, they get there, 
and they meet Abu Sufyan ibn Harb and Ikrimah ibn Abi Jahl along with 200 men from their side. So you have 60 to 80 Muslims who are going to intercept a caravan. They meet these two central figures of Quraysh along with 200 other men. And the question now is, is this going to be like the first one where the Muslims are outnumbered and it ends up becoming a stalemate and nothing happens and everyone goes back home? The answer is no, there was no stalemate here. This is the first time in the history of Islam where jihad fi sabirillah was waged and where arrows were, were fired in the path of Allah. It was in this battle. So in this battle, things escalated and they began to fire arrows at each other at something of a distance. And the first person to fire an arrow fi sabirillah was in this battle. What is his name? Some of you know. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu. The first Rami, the first person to fire an arrow fi sabirillah was Sayyiduna Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. So though it wasn't a stalemate and arrows were fired, it ended up becoming a small skirmish because no one got killed on either side. So it seems likely that both sides avoided direct conflict and it became a small skirmish and both sides left. And the Muslims weren't able to achieve their objective. The objective was not to just strike people down. The objective was to actually uh, seize by force and intercept the material goods of Quraysh that they were using economically to plot and plan against the Muslims. So that objective wasn't met, but it was the first actual ghazwa where arrows were fired. So that is uh, number two. Now, number three, we get to the place called Kharrar. And this was in Dhul Qa'da, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas again with 20 men of the Muhajirun for the purpose of intercepting a caravan. And when he sent them out there, this is a much smaller group if you think about it. When he sent them out there, he told them to not go beyond this place called Kharrar. He said, don't go beyond it. And they went there on foot, walking by night, and it took them five days to get there. And when they finally arrived, they discovered that the caravan had already passed. You see this happening time and again, where they receive intel, or they believe that the caravan is going in this place, they get there and find that they're too late. And soon you'll realize that, that that's exploited to a certain extent by Abu Sufyan, and that becomes the lead up to, the, to Badr itself. This, I, this, this cat and mouse game of them being too late or too early and using basically counterintelligence uh, and psyops to basically spread rumors to get people to think that you're going to be here when actually you're going to be there. That's how Badr ends up starting. So they get there and nothing happens. So they go back. So of the Ghazawat, we know that Badr is the biggest and the most famous of these, but there are some before it. So we're now in the month of Safar, so nearly one year after Hijrah. And Hamza is carrying the war banner for the next Ghazwa. The Prophet wasallam is also going on this one. Remember, we said last week that the Ghazwa and the Sariya are two different things in the literature. Broadly, it's Maghazi. But when we look at the two terms, the Ghazwa, how is it different from the Sariya? We said the Ghazwa is one in which the Prophet ﷺ is participating himself. When it's Sahaba and not the Prophet ﷺ, we call it a Sariya or an expedition. So this is the first Ghazwa in the sense it is the first battle that the Prophet Sallallahu participates in in the history of Islam. It's before Badr, but it's much smaller. So in this Ghazwa, it was in the month of Safar, and Hamza carried the Liwa again. And this time, because the Prophet Sallallahu is on this expedition, he leaves someone in Medina to look after the affairs 
to basically make sure everything is taken care of. So he delegated authority and responsibility to Sa'ad ibn Ubadah radiallahu anhu to basically look after Medina and its people while he's gone. And from this you have a very important lesson which is delegating authority, delegating responsibilities. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the supreme ruler yet he delegates authority in his absence. So this is a role that has to be nurtured within people so that when they receive those uh, responsibilities in someone's absence they can do the job well. So Sa'ad ibn Ubadah is in Medina and the Muslims, the small group with the Prophet وسلم, they go to this place to intercept a caravan and once again it's 70 muhajirun and no ansar, 70 of them and they go to this place called Waddan or Abwa but they face no harm, nothing really happens, uh, no battle occurs but something else really powerful happened, really positive. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam goes there, I don't think it's marked on the map, uh, oh yeah here it is, number four. Uh, so when he gets there, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam doesn't engage in any battle, there are no caravans to intercept, but he has interactions with the local tribe. And speaking with this tribe called Banu Damra, Banu Damra and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam agree to a treaty a covenant and in drawing that up that extends the authority of the Muslims from Medina outward making that territory that's loyal to the Muslims larger so that's expanding the territory and expanding the authority of Medina so that was a very beneficial thing so because the treaty entails that Banu Damra is not going to side with Quraysh or anyone else fighting the Muslims so that means that this area here is something of a buffer zone or a safe zone. And if anything was to happen, that tribe isn't going to join the Quraysh and add to their numbers. You have this group that's allied with the Muslim community in Medina. This is very significant because if you look at the actual map scale between Medina and Abwa, there's about 100 miles. So this is 100 miles south of Medina. You're, you're basically in good in good hands with a tribe that is allied with you as the Muslim community. So we're now at about a year after the Hijrah and this is where we get to the Ghazwa of Buat number five and the Ghazwa of Buat was carried out by Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu carrying the Liwa and Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh was left in charge of Medina. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu was on this, but the one carrying the banner was Sa'ad ibn Abu Waqqas, and Sa'ad ibn Ubadah was in Medina again. And when the Prophet Sallallahu went on this ghazwa, there were 200 people in total, and they went there to intercept a caravan of Umayyah bin Khalaf. And the caravan of Umayyah bin Khalaf, it is said they had 100 men, but they also had with them 2,500 camels. Imagine you intercept a caravan and there's 2,500 uh, Toyota Corollas or 2,500 uh, Kia Sorentos or something like that. It's valuable. So the opportunity was ripe for them to uh, acquire a great amount of wealth in this Ghazwa. They get there, but guess what happened? They're anticipating the arrival of this caravan headed by Umayyah, but they were a bit late. It had already passed and went a route and they didn't see them. So you see a lot of this happening. It's still called a ghazwa even though no fighting happened. So it's not really a battle. It's an expedition or it is... Uh, whatever term you want to use. If it's a battle, you call it a ma'raka, right? It was a ghazwa only in the sense that the Prophet ﷺ was there, even though there was no fighting. So next week, inshallah, we're going to talk about the skirmishes and the incidents that led up to the smaller Badr, the response of Quraysh to these attempts and how Abu Sufyan maneuvered a little bit, thinking to get away from all of this, 
leading up to what came to be known as the Battle of Badr, insha'Allah ta'ala. We'll probably spend a couple of weeks, if not three, just on Badr itself because there's describing what led up to it, the battle itself, the diagrams, the actions of the Muslims, responses, and the lessons we derive from it. So we may spend a few weeks on that, insha'Allah ta'ala. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. I had more, I had more, but we ran out of time with the kids. Sometimes how about when you read with scholars or them explain the Ghazniwat, they refer to that the Prophet is trying to recapture what was taken from them. As if uh, this is like a, a caravan carrying their stuff and they're trying to regain it. But as you explain it, it it's just the, the, the commercial of Quraysh, wasn't like the... Yeah, uh, it's... Is this recording? Yeah. So we should explore that maybe next week. I, I think it's a good question because we we don't we don't want to be politically correct, uh, which causes us to distort the facts, and at the same time we want to explain it in a way that makes sense. Uh, so we'll talk about that inshallah next week. I'll explore that a little bit about the nature of what it meant for them to seize that and how that became a part of the nature of the warfare because that actually reoccurs and it not only occurs in these skirmishes but also in individual companions in the story of Abu Basir for example like that's that comes up later too where he was doing that as a one man as, as a one-man army trying to do that because of what they did to him so these things do exist and we should explain them we'll do that inshallah <laughs>